Hi and welcome back. I just wanted to show a few games that I picked up over the last few months. While I haven't really been playing anything, I've seen some oh fairly good deals uh, on certain online um, merchants. So I thought I would uh, grab the games while I had a chance. And I hope to get around to yeah, at least reading the rules and playing out a turn or two. Um, both on camera and off camera um, in the um, near future which for me could be months from now but anyway one of the first things I picked up was the old English um, Warhammer magazine <clears throat> this is issue number eight an inside or two complete new games the price at that time was two pounds I'm not sure what that equates to in dollars but those of you who know better than I um, can figure that out. Anyway, um, it covers Albuera, May 16th of 1811, and it also covers the Battle of Vittoria, June 21st of 1813, it looks like. I couldn't find a date anywhere in the magazine or in the games um, telling me when this particular issue was um, produced. I'm sure it was in the early 80s, but I don't, I haven't found exactly when issue 8 was um, made. Inside, you'll find a table of contents. Zoom up here a little bit. Uh, looks like letters to the editor type of thing, a roundup of previous uh, material. We have a couple of articles. One on, uh, looks like Air Force. We also have, what do you got, feedback and a profile of uh, SBI Stonewall, article on artillery through the ages, a little bit on their game Desert Rats, and it also covers the two games of Albuera or Albora and Victoria. And there's an article, it looks like, on Wellington in the Peninsula. Magazine is printed in black and white. There is, uh, for the most part, there is some blue. Um, graphics and illustrations are kind of at a minimal, or at a minimum. Let's see here. I'll try to pull it back a little bit. There's the article on, um, what is it? Uh, is that Air Force, or is it just... Oh yeah, because it looks like over here, pardon me a minute, we have the log sheets, it looks like from uh, <clears throat> Air Force, and it might just be on the tactics of tactical air games too, I'm not sure, I have not read the articles yet, well, concerning the, uh, let's see here, let's see if I can get back into focus, I'm not sure if that's, no, that's not uh, that's not Air Force. Um, it would have the uh, roundel type uh, uh, information. So I'm not sure what game that is. Sorry, <clears throat> but anyway, if I took the time and look, I would know, wouldn't I? Here we have uh, some information. It looks like over here on making some. Uh, amendments or house rules or suggestions on the game drive on Stalingrad and we have some feedback and some game advertising and then we get to the games in question Abuera and Vittoria first game is Albuera, Albera, Abora, whatever I don't speak Spanish uh, it is fairly well laid out, fairly simple. You got your game components, your introduction, of course. Uh, your game turn, how to do bombardment. It's got initiative, stacking, zones of control, movement and combat. There are also commands, artillery, leaders, regrouping, routing and routed and demoralized units, and so on. Um, it's a fairly standard system. You got what one, two, basically three uh, pages of rules. They stop right here, and then there's just some uh, historical background in order of battle. 
And then over here we have the bombardment table, the melee results table, initiative, and train effects chart for that game. And that's pretty much it. Then we come up to Vittoria. Now Vittoria is kind of strange because it seems to just modify the rules to Albuera. Um, <clears throat> but it doesn't go very much into giving a uh, detail of the original rule. It just kind of goes into kind of a modification, changes some things around, and you're just supposed to roll with it. So I don't know. I probably won't mess with it, although it's a battle I'm in, uh, mildly interested in. And at the bottom, you have different uh, combat charts. <clears throat> I don't know how far in I can zoom here. Let's see. And still maintain some form of clarity. But, uh, and this is kind of a, oh, where are we at here? There we are. I don't know how well you're going to zoom, but um, <clears throat> the numbers, the letters, the codes, they're very tiny. Here is a human finger for um, comparison. Um, I'm guessing they just didn't have a whole lot of room on the page. I don't know, but, you know, very tiny. And for my old eyes, it's uh, very tiny. Anyway, we have what looks like more advertisement and uh, stuff like that. More advertisement. I guess, uh, yeah. Let's see here. Now well, there's something here. <clears throat> this issue has, what else has it got in it? There's an article on Wellington and the Peninsula. I guess I should point out that both of these battles occurred um, in the Peninsula War back in the Napoleonic era. Uh, let's see. Looks like Stonewall <clears throat> coming up. At least the map does over there in the corner. Uh, I can't tell for sure. Um, let's see, what have we got here? Mm, different inf infantry soldiers throughout time, it looks like, a little bit. Then we have a, this is a Stonewall one, a little big fight. <clears throat> yeah, it was written by Donald Mack. I see his name running around once in a while. Then we have the articles on artillery and Trebuk, uh, <laughs> Trebruk, uh, as part of the Desert Rats. It has a tactical primer by Jim Hind. And what else do we have? We have, I guess, one of the larger articles, and one of the more well-written ones, I believe, is an analysis of the Third Reich, and this is like, I don't know, the first or second edition, and it's by Paul A. Hurst. It, uh, it's a pretty nice little article, kind of, you know, talks about the original game and gives a detailed breakdown of most of the systems and units and stuff. And that's pretty much it for uh, the magazine, the War Gamer with uh, Albuera and um, Victoria. There is some Q and A down here on on the uh, right side. Anyway, enough of that babbling. Just want to do a quick overview overview of the game components. Uh, this is all under plexiglass, so you'll have to forgive me and just believe what I tell you. Um, the map is printed on a matte, well, no, actually, it's a semi-gloss map, um, hexagonal map. Uh, some of the terrain features include a stream, a road, you've got crest or hillside, uh, yeah, hillside um, terrain. Over here, covered up by these British units, is the actual town of Albuera. It's occupied at the moment, like I said, by British units. This is like one hex of it. Another hex. Um, the rest is just clear terrain. And like I say, it's not very big. I don't even know what. <clears throat> I'd like to say 11 by uh, 17, but, or, yeah, but that wouldn't be accurate because they're uh, A4 sizes over in uh, the UK are different than our 8.5 by 11, so <clears throat> it's not uh, 11 by 17. I have no idea what it is. Anyway, ramble, ramble, ramble. Example of some of the uh, units. 
We have Ballesteros here. This camera doesn't focus too well <clears throat> at closer uh, ranges. Anyway, we have Ballesteros unit there, one of them. There's a couple others. He has a combat strength of a 6 and a movement allowance of a 10. And I better double check these things. <clears throat> I really hate to be embarrassed if that wasn't exactly the case. <clears throat> like I said, read through the rules. Just don't have everything uh, memorized. Yes. And there are your standard, what, infantry, cavalry, leaders, artillery units, that type of thing. Let's see if I can get us over. Oh. Just take, take kind of a wibbly wobbly kind of a thing here. Uh, we have the leader, the guy on the horse. This is Beresford. His numbers indicate. In parentheses, it's a combat factor. Um, I think it applies just if he's attacked, and I think he can uh, add it to or modify uh, a combat results um, odds factor, or maybe a die roll. I don't know. They all seem to go up to six and across from one to four to four to one. Not sure what the leader effects is. Once I find out, I'll try to get that information back to you. The number to his right is his movement allowance <clears throat> and like I say these guys here are Portuguese and British the ones in white are Spanish and then of course we have the French down here in blue um, they're mounted on a glossy yeah, is it glossy semi glossy they have a semi glossy uh, I don't know if we'll get focused here or not but they have a semi-glossy <clears throat> come on, where are you going to focus at? right there not if I can keep my hand from shaking uh, palsy is a terrible thing to have well, we're about there anyway, this is Salt I'm having trouble with Salt setup uh, he's supposed to set up on a hex with an S um, the French all set up on hexes that are marked <clears throat> with letters and stuff on the map, but I cannot seem to find an S where he is supposed to set up at. So I'm gonna I'm trying to find some errata for that, but so far I haven't. Anyway, and moving on, we have uh, the game has a, an overall morale system for the different commands, and I haven't got that far in the rules. I know, I know. Um, but apparently as you take losses, the overall morale for that particular command goes down and bad things start to happen. And on the other side over here, we just have charts, tables, and uh, that's about it. Melee, initiative, artillery. They're printed, uh, these I printed, they're in the rule book, but I printed them out for my own use. <clears throat> so I don't have to keep flipping back and forth in the rule book. Let me see. I get down here close enough. It gives you the phase record chart, which lists the different phases, which I think will be helpful. And we have a turn record chart, which tells you um, well, various things that a turn record chart will tell you. Anyway, that's pretty much it for the Wargamer issue number eight, Albuera and Vittoria. I am going to be playing. Albuera here shortly because it's pretty much a move and shoot type of a game. I mean, you know, there's nothing really special about it, I suppose. Uh, there might be a few t tweaks and stuff here and there to the old Napoleon at Waterloo system, but for the most part, I don't expect it to be too tough or cumbersome. Anyway, just want to give a quick look at that one and I will. Do a quick uh, kind of like unboxing and stuff of the other games that I have recently purchased uh, here in a little bit. Talk to you later. Bye. Hi, and welcome back. The next game I would like to showcase, I guess, is called Robots. It is a Task Force Games game. On the back we have the little blurb. I don't do as I don't do my videos as well as um, Centurion's reviews. He does a much better. Uh, a uh, review of, uh, let's see, what would you call them?
micro games, meta games, that type of thing. Anyway, it's the Sixth World War. The Third World War destroyed the armies, the Fourth World War destroyed the cities, and the Fifth World War destroyed all life on Earth. <clears throat> the space colonies survived, however, and 200 years later, man returned to Earth. But not to stay, only to plunder the riches of his former world. Robots were used to salvage the ancient technological sites. One day, the robots of two salvage corporations met at a particularly valuable site and fired on each other with their mining lasers. The Sixth World War had begun. And then we go down here, <clears throat> below the picture of the hover tank. And we have Robots. It's a science fiction game of the fa fast action and sudden destruction. Players construct their own robots by combining weapons gun, missile, or lasers, with chassis models, track, hover, or droid. Newly constructed robots move out from the factory salvage ships to capture resource areas, then mine the resources to produce new robots, which then capture more salvage robots, or salvage areas, sorry. Robots is an exciting game for two or more players. Robots. It has multiple scenarios and a campaign game. It has a complexity level of fairly easy. Playing time is one or two hours, and it was designed by Mike Jocelyn and William F. Ferguson III. Um, let's see. Like I say, it's like one of the old micro metagame type uh, productions. I keep my camera from falling over while I attempt to zoom out. We've got a couple of mechs battling it out there, it looks like, and it tank coming in with its uh, micro-missiles or whatever, trying to take out the robots, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, I don't know how many pages the rules are. I keep my camera steady. Aha! Tripods. What an invention. Oh, what do we got? It's all in black and white. Stacking tables of this, tables of that, zones of control. Um, different scenarios, designer notes, your combat results table on the back, game credits on the left down there, Stephen Cole was the game development, uh, any other names I know, well rules editing was by Leanna M. Cole, might be a relation, R. Vance Buck had something to do with the graphics and playtesting, um, let's see here, made in 1980. Uh, out of the city of Amarillo. One thing I found interesting, and I, like I said, I haven't really gotten into the rules yet. And I will show you the counters here real quick. Now, let's just go ahead and zoom in. It'll be a lot more blurry, but they won't be quite as uh, shaky. Um, we have two different colors. One is kind of an orange, and the other is a blue. I'm just going to look at the blue since they're a little bit closer with, and keep from falling off. From what I can tell, and I don't know exactly because I haven't even read the rules, this is just basically like an, un, an unzipping kind of a video. It looks to me like these will be like your, um, what I want to say, not the chassis. What was the chassis? Yeah, these are like your chassis. So you have tracked vehicles here. You have droid. Those are R. Yeah, you have droid legs. And you have a, or you can have a hover body. You can also have a drill on these guys. And then at the bottom, we have the different weapon systems. So basically, you're going to have a chassis on the bottom. Let me make sure I don't hose this up. Of tracks, droids, or hover. And then you're going to have, I may be using the wrong term, but anyway, then you're going to like put weapons on it. So I think. The stacking limit is like, I don't know, three or higher. But basically, you're building your unit from the bottom up, so to speak, um, by picking a, you know, let me just give you the proper verbiage here instead of just leave you guessing. Uh, let's see. We have track chassis, droid and hover chassis. We have drill modules and a submerged marker. And then there's gun modules, laser modules, rocket modules, and there's factory counters and factory ships, and there's one suicide robot counter, and some electronic warfare modules. So, like I said, you're going to build your robot from the ground up, 
or the bottom up, I guess you would say. And uh, what you build will affect how you move, how you fight, that type of thing. So uh, that some something that kind of uh, attracts me to the game. Counters are fairly decent, you know, for their time. They're not thick. They're not terribly thin. They're mounted on a fairly decent stock. They are glossy. The map is kind of, uh, I'll show you the map now, robots. I'm just going to do a quick segue there, I guess. Um, pull back a little bit. <clears throat> that would be back. There we go. Uh, robots, 1980, Test Force Games. I don't know what the different terrain features are, but the map is um, paper, hexagons, and... Uh, um, I think it's it doesn't it's a uh, plain paper. I don't think there's it doesn't feel like there's a gloss glossy coating to it. Uh, let's see here. Zoom out now. I guess that's as far as we're going at the moment. Let's see here. The unveiling of the mining planet. Don't know what all the terrain features are. I'm not sure what these little guys are. I think there are certain types of resource hexes. That'd be my guess. And body of water, I guess, some other stuff, and, um, well, anyway, it's a hexagonal map where you'll move your little robots across. So, anyway, it's, uh, one of task force smaller, like I say, um, micro, mini type games, metagaming kind of a concept for them. And I'm not sure what I paid for this, I think $10. Um, postage was more, well, actually I paid, yes, I paid $10, I can't see that ten dollars and four dollars in shipping and I'm sure you don't really care about that so I will move on to the next game continuing my fascination for English games I have picked up uh, let's see this is gonna be nice there's a really light yellow on a kind of a brownish background I picked up Wargamer issue number seven it's on the Battle of Marston Moor pounds, or it was at the time, and um, one of my favorite eras and favorite battles is the English Civil War, 30 Years War um, era of combat, and um, Marston Moore is one of my favorite battles to study on the English Civil War. It's pretty much like the other magazine that I showed you earlier. We have our contents, and looks like they talk a little bit about the, the Battle of e uh, Marston Moor. We have some stuff on Elau. No Land of Sun and Oranges. That's uh, Bob Ladder talks about games on the Italian campaign. We have Condor, First Impressions by Keith Poulter. I think that's a game that they are, were in the process or did design. Victory in the Pacific, Simon Feld on Japanese... Simon Field, sorry, on Japanese strategy, and a report on SPI Yugoslavia, and some of the same stuff, uh, other stuff. Um, geez, I guess maybe I should do that. Yeah, you're still going to see Albuera over there in the corner. I have very little table space here. We have letters in the roundup, and then we have Alma and the quads, spotlight on certain games. This time we've got kind of a green uh, background. It looks blue still. And then we have what do we have some amendments to frigate, some variations and stuff. And we're talking about what are we talking about here? Ah, the English Civil War. Duh. And the road to Marston Moor. More feedback. Um, Dresden, which will um, you'll notice here in a minute. More about this game. And then we have the game, Marston Moor. Uh, designed by... Who designed this thing? I don't know. Anyway, we have charts, tables, combat ratios, unit types. Um, we surely have more than just that. What do we have? Like, Well, another one of these extensive rule books that are going to keep you up all night. That uh, looks like one page, two pages, three pages. I mean, even over here, we're in the game length and victory conditions. And then we flip to the last page, and um, try to get a better view over here. The 
brain effects chart and designer notes and stuff. So we're looking at about four pages or something like that. So not very much to it. I didn't realize they made such a, you know, simpler type games, I would say. I don't know if that's uh, simple or just less involved. Anyway, more game shop advertisements for places I'm sure that don't exist anymore. We have the Ops Room, which talks more about Desert Rats. And then we have, oh, just kind of like an old SPI magazine. You have stuff about factories in space, uh, what, version of Future Warfare, um, armored personnel carrying tank, that type of stuff. So, and then we have a, looks like a large article on Elao, another one of my favorite battles of the Napoleonic era. I have probably four games on it. And then we have Operation Condor and some articles over here. The No Land of Sun and Oranges deals with uh, the um, Sicily type area, landings, that type of thing. And just continuation of those articles. And we have, it looks like back in the old Avalon Hill days, they would uh, put a, oh, I can't think of what it was. It was some kind of challenge or contest. And, you know, you had to pick the right answer to a problem they posed. And, I don't know, won a t-shirt or something. can't remember. A little article on Victory in the Pacific over here. And the article on Yugoslavia. And that's pretty much it. So more uh, uh, another game shop type ad. Alright. I'm going to have to move something here. I'm going to knock everything over. We'll look at the map first, I guess. Yes, keep the audience involved. Here we go. I'm a big fan of Mystery Science Theater 3000 in all of its various forms. So... I know you can tell by my really happy uh, voice and excited voice that that's just the, game, uh, the show for me. Anyway, I do love it. And I, you know, like to quote from it as often as I can. Um, the map of Marston Moor. It is a thick paper. It's matte finished. The hexagons are unnumbered. Train types are pretty simple, I would imagine, for this era. We have the white site close. Um, which I think was defended by the um, white, uh, I want to call them white coats, but that's not the right name. Anyway, they did a kind of a last ditch stand uh, for the royalists there while the rest uh, fled the field. Anyway, we have the ditch, which the royalists posted some, a forlorn hope of muskets and stuff to uh, kind of like skirmishers to break up the approach of the parliamentarians. We actually have over here the Cromwell Plump, which was a hill with some trees on it. Um, somewhere around there, Cromwell um, put his um, headquarters for a while. Off to the right over here, we have Long Marston, after which the uh, battle was named. This is Marston Hill, I suppose. And off to the side here, we have the village of Talkwith. Um, like I say, this is the parliamentarian side. These are the guys who are against the king and the royalists. And then we have the royalists over here with Rupert and um, his guys. So, anyway, it's a pretty simple map. I'm going to give the old uh, cliche a, it's functional. It's not going to win any prizes. Probably even by the standard of the day, it wasn't uh, particularly... Um, um, whatever you want to say. Exciting. Comes with two counter sheets. They have that same kind of weird semi gloss uh, blank on the back. They have that weird semi gloss kind of finish on them. Um, you're not going to get a good picture there, but that's about the best I can do at the moment. Um, you've got your basic uh, types, I believe, are cavalry and the pikemen up there, infantry. You have 
secondary units, which are the pikemen and the artillery, or I'm sorry, the musketeers and the artillery. Um, they're kind of like supporting units. They don't operate exactly in the same way as the combat units of cavalry and infantry. Um, but like I said, they, uh, they operate a little differently. They're, they engage in combat and movement um, just a little different. Anyway, one thing I noticed about this game, these being the um, par la la Royalists, is we have Rupert over here in Newcastle. But they give a, a leader here named Hurry. And according to the map, he was over there the northeastern side of the battlefield. I have not been able to find any reference to him playing a prominent role in the battle whatsoever. Um, I have several English Civil War sources, and he's mentioned back in the index kind of a thing, but not as leading any kind of troops, not as warning, not warranting a counter in here um, amongst the great, you know, Rupert, Newcastle, Ethian, Goring, so... I'm not sure uh, where the designer um, got his information for this particular leader, but there he is. And then we show the parliamentarians, the roundheads I believe they are, pretty much the same thing, same type of information, yeah, almost the same type of blurriness. Um, here you can see um, Cromwell's off to the right. I can't see him too well because right there is where I pushed the button to uh, start recording. He, uh, the letters at the beginning of their, um, uh, on their counter to the left, indicate whether they're infantry or cavalry leaders. Well, Cromwell is printed as an infantry leader. However, it should be clearly known that he is a cavalry leader. So that is part of the errata. Um, to make a mistake like that would be... You know, they would deserve to be flogged, but, you know, I think it's cool, whatever. So these are the counters, like I said, they're kind of a semi-matte, or semi-gloss uh, thing. Well, I can almost make them disappear if I wiggle them just right in the light. Um, anyway, um, map is, or not map, what am I talking about? The counters are blank in the back, and I printed out some player aids along with the errata just to help me... Um, you know, so I have to refer to the book all the time. So, that's pretty much it for Wargamer number 7 or whatever it was I said. Um, looks like the counters were printed in 78. I thought the game was printed in uh, 80 or something, so who knows. Anyway, we'll call it late 70s, early, um, early 80s. So, that's another one that I picked up. And I'll show you another one in a little bit. See you. Okay, welcome back again. Um, my last video, I told you that, um, or hinted that Dresden would be coming up here pretty soon and playing a prominent role in one of my uh, not unboxing videos, but just a, I can call it show and tell. Um, this is Dresden 1818, a historical simulation battle game from Simulation Games 1978, printed in England. Yes, I have been, uh, like I said, acquiring quite a few English games. Their A4 paper size kind of really throws me off, but, you know, it's cool. It's quaint. Roll book. Uh, let's see. It's going to be in black and white. This one has a little bit of markings in it. The underlining on some of the major headers is all underlined and there's a couple there's a little bit of notations and markings in it but nothing to uh, uh, no big showstopper uh, this is a train effects chart I think I made a copy of that pretty sure I did um, the game is designed by Ken Broadhurst and it has Chris Hunt and Jim Hind as some of the play testers names that are familiar from uh, this era and company uh, let's see here. I never did find out how many pages. The paper is matte finished. Matte finish. Whatever. Oh, uh, what are we looking at? Where do these people put pages? Page numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, about 5, 6 if you count the um, train effects chart. 
So not very much. They try to pack a lot of information into just a few pages. And sometimes that can lead to um, problems. Let's see here. We've got a really nice uh, logo at the top. Very nice. The Battle of Dresden on the 26th and through the 28th of August of 1813. And here we have, you know, a little bit on the counters. You're not going to probably see much. They don't have a ton of information on them. Let's see. Set up in sequence of play. What is our sequence of play? In all scenarios, the French player moves first. Firstly, he reorganizes whatever units are available and then establishes which units are in command control. After moving whatever in command control, whatever, which units are in command control, after moving these, he'll have a combat phase. Then the allied player gets to do his thing. Anyway, so this game has, you know, stacking, zones of control, combat, that type of thing. Forts, fortifications, uh, and uh, even has a special rule up here, which I find kind of neat. Can't wait to actually uh, get to uh, experience it. Yeah, I guess it's over here. It has to do with uh, fighting in the city of Dresden itself, uh, in the suburbs. That's uh, probably a little blurry. Um, basically, certain parts of the suburbs had been demolished in order to clear the line of sight for artillery in the Allstadt. In the Allstadt, certain perimeter hexes in the Allstadt are marked. This is on the map with the letters A to E. Certain hexes in the suburbs are marked with corresponding letters to indicate that a line of fire has been cleared. Thus, an artillery unit in the Allstadt hex marked C would be able to fire into any suburb. Any unit in a suburb hex marked C. Uh, I know I just read that completely awkwardly, but anyway. Similarly, any artillery unit on a suburb hex marked C would be able to fire on another outer hex marked C as long as a shot is aimed along the line, that type of thing. So apparently you can shoot through the cities through certain hex sides and stuff. And um, the only really major thing I found uh, in the rules that I found... Um, Oh, I don't know what it is. It's just a quaint thing, I guess. Everything's quaint. Another cliche term. We have a little bit of... Uh, I don't know if I have to do this for formatting reasons, and I will come to this eventually once I find out where I'm at on the camera. Uh, let's see here. Hmm. If I don't know where we're at, you're surely not expected to know where we're at. Well, anyway, yeah, well, it's not that important. Anyway, part of the command control rules over here uh, are also printed over here somewhere. Um, it's just like it was transposed or, you know, repeated. Um, so all the paragraphs and stuff look nice, but it's no major, no major deal. And then we just have um, setups and there's weather and night, um, light rain, heavy rain, demoralization, reorganization, leader units, setup locations, all that type of stuff. So, set up hexes, and then we have player notes, and that's about it. So, that's about it for the rule book. Let's back out a little bit. There is the terrain effects chart <laughs> that I copied. Um, scanned, copied. Not quite sure why I don't have all the combat tables readily available, but. Huh, well, whatever. Uh, they might be down here. I think we'll look at some of the counters real quick because the map is down even lower, farther down the bottom. They're um, colored um, by command, basically. The French, of course, are going to be in more bluish type colors. The Russians in green. Um, Austrians, I believe, are in white. Austrians are, yeah, Austrians, I think they are. Um, 
and the colors, the little color circles indicate the formation that it belongs to, and that kind of thing. This is one of the French uh, ally units. Don't remember how, sorry, how close I can get to him and keep him in some kind of a focus. Um, there's like one part there where it wants to focus and then I just totally miss it. Um, it's very hard for me to read these guys, even with magnifying glasses. But anyway, this is a three-string point cavalry brigade. And I'll look at it here. It's first cavalry. Chattel, something like that, is its commander. And they have a backside, printed in red. Uh, where am I? Which indicates a demoralization or disruption or something like that. You know, if I move it back and forth, back and forth quickly enough, I think it'll focus enough to read it. Anyway, those are the counters. They're printed on a glossy um, cardboard material. There. Where are we at? There we are. They're thin by today's standards. But another cliche, they're serviceable. Uh, there, I think. Um... Just a little bit hard to read because of their size. What else do we have here? I think we have a map. Hold on a minute. Uh, let's see. Looks like they photocopied uh, the errata. Is there a rat in there? Yeah, on the Empire part down there, there's a errata. And another problem to solve and uh, send back. Okay, I'm going to have to zoom out for this. Sorry if you got my hairy armpit in there. I apologize. This is the map um, for the Battle of Dresden. We have over on the left-hand side demoralization tracks, that kind of thing. Uh, let me see here. Get my act together here eventually. Different demoralization tracks. The combat table is way up at the top, or there's one over here um, in easier reach. Um, what do we have here? We have different movement allowances and stuff for units, um, depending upon the weather conditions. At the bottom is the turn record track. No, I have no idea what it's a uh, time units and stuff like that. There we go. And anyway, I'll just take a quick look up here. I'm not going to try to point out all the terrain features, but... Oh. Okay. That is Dresden there, despite its odd angle. I'm trying not to mess up my other game down there, which, yes, is still a hall borough. Um, now that I've hidden my train effects chart... Dresden suburb, I believe, are these hexes down here. And the fortified town itself, uh, behind the larger or the darker hexes that have the little um, projections on them. And let's see if we can't find uh, where the fortress, the fortress is right. Let's notice that. Fortress is over... Where's a fortress at? Fortified town. Fortress. Defender triple. That'd be like fork something. Uh, that one. That's a fortress hex. Did you see that? Yes. Uh, what else do we have? Where is the Gross Garden? Gross Garden. Whatever it is. That is right here. Take you down a minute. The uh, green, darker green area there in the middle is the Gross Garden. And um, in the different uh, gates and stuff like that. I guess what I really want to show you, and myself for that matter, is in the suburbs. And this is going to be hard to see, I'm afraid. Ugh. That there is definitely hard to see. Um, 
here we have kind of what they were talking about, um, the fire lanes that they cleared through the, the town. I know the numbers are going to be very hard to see. Where am I at over there? By two. And there's like a small D here, and there's a large D up here. So I'm assuming that you can fire from D to D. There's a D, there's a D, there's a D. So it looks like they cleared a fire lane around here from this major part of the fort or fortress um, walls. So that's kind of interesting. D could not um, say fire through here, of course, nor through C. Um, so I think that's kind of a cool effect. Um, anyway, that's pretty much the game. Um, I'm looking forward to playing it. Like I say, I'm going to play some of these um, here at home, and some will be online. And we'll just kind of see what happens. Okay, what else do I have? Well, I see a couple more. Um, I think I'm about now. I got one more English game, looks like. Um, actually, it's a Swedish game. All right, I'll be back in a sec.